writings up? What? G'day all and welcome to New Parenting Hangout. I'm Tom from uh, Melbourne, Australia, connecting with you again. And uh, we're just following up, up on our series about uh, postnatal expression, postnatal depression. So this week we've been posting about postnatal depression or postpartum depression. Um, we've had some great interaction again. Um, I'd like to invite anyone that would wants to join us to come on in um, or leave your questions and stuff below the uh, in the comments section. So I just wanted to introduce uh, Tammy again. So how are you today, Tammy? I'm good. Thanks for asking, Tom. No problems. And where are you hanging out from, Tammy? I'm hanging out from sunny Melbourne, Australia. Yeah. And you look like you've got a bit of change of scenery in the background. I have. I've moved into the corner, into my very nice old barber's chair. Like, oh, Beautiful. I'm going to get a haircut after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Well, uh, I haven't changed location, but I've changed the uh, Hangout uh, dashboard has changed. The actual interface itself has changed a little bit from my end. So um, bear with us if there's anything that's uh, slightly amiss compared to what it normally is. Um, but we'll move into the today's topic. So Tammy, I just wanted you to um, recap just a little bit on postnatal expression and what you, uh, how you described what that was, that, that period of time straight after the birth. And then we'll move into um, postnatal expression because uh, we covered all that in, in a lot of detail last week and just like to recap just a little bit. So postnatal expression is what is otherwise known as the baby blues. It's a really, really normal part of the postnatal um, journey for most mothers. About 80% of women report feeling um, post -baby, postnatal blues or the baby blues. And what this is, is that this is um, a, a sudden dip in the hormones. It, it, you see it in quite significant mood changes with feeling low, feeling weepy, feeling a bit overwhelmed and some real ups and downs emotionally, even from women who may be generally really quite stable emotionally. It often kicks in at about day three and can last a good couple of weeks for some women. Most women it doesn't last that long. For some women it can last a little bit more. But it's a fairly normal and typical part of that postnatal journey mm -hmm. and um, it's just a part of the process of the hormones settling back down to life after a baby. Okay, so moving from um, postnatal expression into postnatal depression, how do you um, tell the difference, I guess, and what, what was, what's typical and normal in, uh, I guess, postnatal expression and then how would you tell the difference moving into postnatal depression? So look, that's where one of the, ch the the real challenges come into it Tom because a lot of the symptoms of postnatal depression are very similar to the baby blues. Um, the, the difference being that the baby blues we expect to see in mothers, we, we expect it to, we, to see it really quite soon after the birth but we also expect it to be resolving within like two or three weeks. Um, and even in those baby blues or those ups and downs, you're going to see, have women that have still got a sense of humour. They, they're still getting enjoyment out of their baby. They, um, they're probably very tired, but, but they, they've got normalcy happening. They've got moments of light happening as well as these downs. Postnatal depression tends to go on for longer and significantly more of the day is low than it is then it is good and it increases in severity and it doesn't start to resolve on its own. And that's when you would start to suspect that this is more than the, the typical postnatal journey for a mum. There's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you've got more dark than light um, is, is a way to look at that, Tammy, is that right? Yeah. You know, we used the expression last time about a stormy, like a stormy day or a stormy week, you know, even on a stormy day you're going to have moments of sunshine where the clouds part and you see sunshine and blue skies. With a woman who's got postnatal depression, there are very few moments of sunshine. Um, and there are, she, she loses her enjoyment in everyday life. She loses her appetite. She's very, very tired but can't sleep. And, you know, all of those things that we'll talk about in a little while about what, they, what are the signs of it. Um, but, it, you know, 
the, the thing with um, postnatal depression is it's very much about timing. So if you are having these symptoms five days after your baby's born, we would expect that this is pretty normal. If you're having days and days like this five weeks after your baby's born, something else is probably going on. Yep, yep. Perfect. Perfect. So what is the main cause then, Tammy, um, in your experience? You know, I, I find, you know, for myself, and I'm not an expert here, but I'm just saying from observation, in my experience, I think there are two types of postnatal depression. I think there is um, what you would probably call um, social or circumstantial postnatal depression, and then you've got pathological postnatal depression. So you may have mums who are parenting on their own. They might have partners who are deployed, or they might be single parenting you know, because they don't have a partner or they may have a partner who is away a lot because of work, but basically they're single parenting. So as a result, and they don't have an extended family around them. So as a result, they are sleep deprived, they don't have a good support network around them. They're trying to, they, their expectations of themselves are really quite high. They may have people around them who are judgmental, you know, or, or, or unhelpful like that. And all these things together just bring this woman down, who's already hormonally having these down days anyway, but it brings her mood down even more and so that it, it's very difficult for her to resolve. So that's what I would call circumstantial because with more support she would probably feel better. And these women often will respond to counselling and to support and that's all they need to actually start to, to move through this postnatal depression. It's still very real depression, but it, it, a different treatment will work with it. Whereas with what I would call pathological depression, this is a significant chemical imbalance in this woman's body and in her brain. There's nothing she can do about it. There's nothing that her family could do to change this. This is a chemical imbalance and she, the, the help that she's going to need is probably going to be more medication as well as counselling and support. Okay, I think that's a, a really clear distinction between the two. Um, and I, I always think with everything that uh, there's not one, um, one way that you can look at something. There's not just one way that, that people can, or one category people can fall into. So I think that um, that will help people actually understand and be able to deal with things a little bit better. So, Tammy, you touched on people that don't have a great support network around them. So who else is at risk um, of developing postnatal depression? The women who you would, you would um, be, as a doula, I, the person that I would be really watching carefully is someone who is struggling with antenatal depression, so preg pregnancy depression. Someone who has a history of significant depression before they were pregnant. Um, someone who has developed significant postnatal depression, whether it was circumstantial or pathological depression, but with a previous pregnancy. Um, as well as women who are in very unsupportive relationships or, you know, in less than ideal circumstances without much support. These are the women that I would see that would be more at risk of developing postnatal depression. The other thing too is that we tend to see is women who have a very traumatic birth experience can can really go into this post-traumatic stress slash depression that can last for a significant period of time afterwards. Okay. Um, so what are some of the main symptoms then, Tammy? Um, you've touched on a few already, but can you elaborate a little bit further on that? So we went through the, the symptoms of postnatal expression or the baby blues, uh, which is the feeling weepy and fragile and, you know, all of these things, feeling very tired. These are also symptoms of postnatal depression, but they become often more extreme. So you may have a woman who's very tired but can't sleep. Um, you may have a woman who then starts to lose a lot of weight, even though she wasn't, she's not even trying, or she puts on an extreme amount of weight because she's she's just eating a real lot. 
Um, you have you have women who just cannot stop crying. They're crying a lot, frequently during the day, frequently during the night. They're not finding any enjoyment in anything. They're completely uninterested in, in everything that would normally have given them pleasure. And this includes things like their partner, sex, their own their baby. You know everything that would you would expect a mum would be warming back after a couple of months and so to find joy in just no joy in any of these things at all. These women will often really isolate themselves. They feel a lot of guilt, they feel a lot of um, resentment towards their baby, towards their partner um, and then they feel guilty that they feel like that and then they start to ha can start to have thoughts of harming themselves or harming the baby or you know suicidal thoughts. So this is where it becomes a, a lot more extreme the, the um, the symptoms and the signs that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you kind of touched on, on two things. My next question to you was actually going to be what are the what are the signs of that? You kind of it seems like there's a little bit of a blur between the symptoms and, and the signs. Is there any way that you can um, distinguish between the two um, so what symptoms are versus what the signs that other people can recognize are? So the symptoms are what a woman feels. Okay, so so the symptoms are she may be feeling fragile, really fragile. She may be feeling irritation and feeling no joy and feeling um, no connection with her baby and, and and all these symptoms that she's feeling. But the real kicker with postnatal depression is like a lot of other depressions, women feel very fearful or guilty or worthless actually disclosing that they feel this way so they hide it really well. Um, and you often hear reports about mums who stayed in bed all day, they just could not get themselves out of bed, they barely did anything except feed their baby and then they jump out of bed at 4.30 in the afternoon to try and make it look to their partner coming home that they've been up. Or if they hear that someone rings and say they're coming over, they'll get up and put their makeup on or something to make it look like they've been up. But if no one calls and no one knows, they may not shower for two or three days because they just can't get their head around even doing the basic things of looking after themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, sorry, so that's the, the symptoms are what the woman feels, the signs are what the people around her can observe. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think the best way to go about that is like you, you obviously don't want to um, as a supportive partner, you, you obviously pick up on some things, but if someone's trying to hide something, sometimes it can be very difficult to pick up on these things. So how do you go about, um, I guess, approaching the subject? Because it's probably quite a touchy subject and, and coming from a partner or someone else, um, approaching and saying, are you struggling with this? And um, that could actually cause a little bit of confrontation or um, maybe even trigger it and make it a little bit worse. Um, so what are some of the, the key signs that you should be looking for? So I would I would say as a partner looking on or very close family members looking on, a woman who is re who is reporting that she's very, very fatigued, like which is we know that's normal in those early weeks. But by the time the baby's a couple of months old, you would expect that mum is starting to get a little bit on top of that fatigue or finding other ways to get sleep. So a mum who's reporting that she's very, very tired and just wanting to stay in bed all day, every day, or who is very touchy, so bursts into tears very easily, or has lost motivation to do stuff that she may normally do, like maybe do a little bit around the house or you know have a, a shower every day. These are normal things that a mum would be, you would expect that she'd be starting to get back into the swing of because that's her own motivation. Or the flip side of that, you may become a, you may see a woman become very compulsive where she's vacuuming three times a day. And, you know, th this is the other extreme about it. Um, I wish I got that. I didn't. But <laughs> vacuum once a month. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, so, so as a partner looking on, 
seeing a mum who's just really struggling, seeing that she has no sense of humour, seeing that things just nothing. If she's had a you know fairly good sense of humour before, seeing that she's that she's lost interest in food or she's lost interest in things that she would normally be doing, these are these are signs that something's going on. And one of the ways that I would suggest that you can approach that is wait for a good time, not when you're in the middle of a blue because she has not seen the funny side of something that you've done. Wait for an appropriate time and then say to her, you know, it's really, really obvious that you're just not having a good time and it's not your fault. You're doing really well but I can see that you're really struggling. I think we need to talk to someone about this because you don't need to feel like this. You know, because, you know, this is, this is the same thing that we talk to women about breastfeeding, Tom. We talk to them about a lot of things that are to do with new parenting. Women think that it's going to hurt or well, women think everyone feels like this and actually, no, they don't. When we talk about 80% of women getting the baby blues, we mean they have a few days where they feel down, but then they start to feel better. You know, 80% of women don't feel like rubbish for three months. That's not that's not okay. You don't need to feel like that, and there are lots of things that people can do to help, but you need to go to the right people. So from a partner's perspective, Tammy, then I, I think one of the other things that could potentially come up is your relationship if it's been really strong, is starting to have a few little tremors or something in it that that you're you're starting to argue a little bit more than you normally would. Um, everyone, look, I think that everyone has uh, hiccups in in the road along the way. But if those hiccups become more like speed bumps, that might be a, another sign. But what about something like sex, Tammy? If um if your partner's just not interested in 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 that as well, can that be a sign that they're just not engaging in the, in, I guess, the um, intimate relationship, not, it's not so much the act, but being close, um, are they going to be separating further apart from you? Yeah, you know, that's, that's, a really, that's a really good point to bring up, and especially because uh, we know that a woman who is breastfeeding, her libido changes in that first 12 months after she's had a baby. Most women find that their sex drive is significantly reduced because they are breastfeeding and they are getting all these feel-good hormones through the breastfeeding and it, it takes their attention away from sex. As you know, it's probably nature's way of like your contraception. Not only are you breastfeeding through the night and you're feeling really tired and you don't feel like sex anyway because your libido is low. So it's a good way to, to sort of stall having another baby. But there is a difference between libido and wanting to engage lovingly with your partner. And a woman who's got postnatal depression is feeling just dreadful. You know, women report feeling like they are drowning inside. They feel like they're in this deep, dark hole where there is no joy, there is no love, they feel worthless. When you feel like that, you don't want to engage emotionally with your partner. Even though you desperately need it, it's very, very difficult to do. So if you see that your partner is withdrawn, and like we're not talking about a woman who's really happy and bonding well with her baby and everything is fine, she just doesn't want to have sex. We're not talking about that. You know, we're talking about a whole lot of different signs that you're observing in your partner. And yes, wanting withdrawing emotionally is is a significant sign. Okay. Thank Thanks for clarifying that, Tammy. Um, so what are the usual treatments? I heard you say before that um, counselling is one way that you can deal with this So, and speaking to the right people. Um, so is it important to surround yourself with the right people for that, for number one? And then I guess what are the other treatment options? And I know you touched on medication before, but what are some of the other treatment options? You know, I'm... I'm not a fan of treating any illness just hardcore straight away go for the medicine. I, I think that there are always, there's reasons why your body is responding the way it is and, and masking it with a medication is not usually the best way to do it. Um, having said that, we know, especially with pathological um, 
depression, we know that medication will frequently be the only thing that helps. You know, it, it because it's a chemical imbalance. Um, and as like with anything else in your life, if you have got it lacking and you can't get it through natural means, there is a, going to be a real need for medication to help with that. That's, that's a given. But this is the other thing that we know about depression. We know that depression usually ha comes in a three-pronged approach, okay? And, and doing one thing will usually not be enough. We, but we know that depression is helped by exercise, it's helped by counselling and it's helped by medication. Sometimes one will, will lift your mood, often two will be needed and sometimes three. Now it's unfortunate if the one you go for is medication because if you can get some counselling you're going to find strategies and exercise is going to be great for you anyway as a new mum to, to help you to build your own health, to look after your child. And, you know, these things are always going to work better in conjunction with each other. Okay, so does it matter the order that you go in there, Tammy? Because what I'm hearing from you is that if, if you counted them as um, exercise and, and, I guess, a balanced diet and everything as the first step, and then the second step being counselling, and then the third step being uh, medication. So could you swap one and two around, so maybe go counselling first and then get into a bit more exercise, um, rather than going to the counselling first, uh, sorry, to the medication and then working your way back? Is it, is it better to start off with something that you can do that doesn't um, necessarily involve a whole heap of people to start off with, and then move up the, the scale, I guess? You know, look, I think, I think ideally, it's you're not going to hurt by doing some exercise, and you're not going to hurt by doing some counselling. But I think that there will be women who watch this, or there will be partners that watch this that are seeing signs in their partners where we are beyond where counselling and where exercise is going to help. You know, if you've got a, a woman who's got serious thoughts about harming herself or harming her baby. She needs medical help because she must be feeling terrible to get to that point. That's a that's a horrible, horrible place to be. Mm -hmm. And and for women like that, like if you've got postnatal psychosis or something like that, that comes on very hard and very fast, and you don't have time for the more gentler strategies to work. Um, I, I would say that if you've got a woman who feels like she's got postnatal depression, and and she's like she's more than four weeks out from the birth and she feels like she's going downhill, she needs to be talking to a GP. Now her, at least her GP or maternal child health nurse or somebody professional because they may say to her, listen, we'll watch you for a week, you know, let's try giving you half an hour exercise a day and I'll arrange for you to talk to a counsellor. But but I think that if you're feeling at this point that you are developing postnatal depression, it's it's really important to actually seek professional help, and that professional help might be a naturopath, and a naturopath might have some really really great ideas, but a but a decent naturopath who is presented with a mum with serious postnatal depression will know what they're doing and will refer you to a GP and continue to treat you themselves. It's just there's no like with you said before there's no one right way to do anything, and. I think if you're two or three weeks out from the birth and you're feeling really low, starting some exercise is a really good idea to see if that makes a shift, if see if it helps. And definitely your diet, like watching, putting what you, is good into you is going to, you know, help you to feel better no matter what you're doing. Um, and talking to someone is going to be really good as well in that sort of situation. But it, it just really depends what signs and symptoms are going on. That, but I do know, look, I've, I've been with clients myself and I do know that there are some women where things happen really quite rapidly and you just don't have time to try the natural remedies because there's, there's unsafe stuff going on for that woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something that I just wanted to ask in there, Tammy, and clarify a bit further. So you said 
So if they do go to a GP, a GP is better than not going to anyone at all. But would it be better to someone to go to someone that specialises in more, I guess, like a, a child health, maternal child health care nurse, where they deal with women regularly and with babies, and they would see the signs and symptoms more regularly than, say, a GP, where they may not see um, women that present with this as often. Um, so either a as I said, maternal, maternal child healthcare nurse, and um, even or a psychologist. Um, so sorry, slip of the tongue with uh, trying to get too many words out at the same time. Um, but yeah, it would it be better to go and see someone that's specialised in this field? Yes, but quite often, quite often, Tom, you've actually got to go to a GP to get a referral. Um, there are, it depends, if you've birthed in a private hospital, they'll often have a mother-baby unit um, that you can that you can go to. If you've had a, if you've been private, if you're privately insured and you've had a private obstetrician, you can actually talk to them at your um, six-week checkup. But you know, for some women, to wait to six weeks, honestly, I had postnatal depression with one of mine, and at four weeks, if I was told I had to wait another two weeks to get help, I don't know what I would have done. It was terrible. It was terrible. So I would say to I would say to someone, if you're feeling really low and it's not getting better, and you're having several days in a row where you're feeling down, go back to the hospital where you had the baby and ask to go to the mother baby unit. Go to you know go go to your maternal child health nurse. You know do whatever. Usually, I I know where you're going with the whole GP thing because GPs often you know, if you've got a GP that knows you really well, that's fantastic. But if you're going to a clinic where a GP doesn't know you, the, the, often the easiest thing will be just to prescribe antidepressants. And you know, there, you do need that broader pronged approach. So I, I do, I do think in those early stages, going back to the hospital, the hospitals here in Australia have really good support systems for mothers with postnatal depression. If you know the right places to go in there. Okay, perfect. Um, so Tammy, I guess one of the other things, what can, like, sorry, oh, let me go back a step. So you just touched on some alternative uh, treatments and I guess like so if it's a step before that where it's not as serious, we've talked about exercise and food um, and going to the naturopath. Is there anything else that would help um, with this, like maybe Doing some yoga or meditation or, or something something along those lines that um, wouldn't be considered mainstream um, medicine. Look, there's a lot. There are a lot of um, different alternative therapies that are going to absolutely going to help a mum with postnatal depression. The challenge is with a woman with significant postnatal depression. They, she will frequently lack the motivation to go and do anything. So whereas you know a postnatal yoga class or a Pilates class or something may be just so good for her, to get her to actually sign up to it and get herself there and get someone to look after the baby and to have prepared by pumping milk so she can leave the baby, it's all way too hard. I'd just rather stay in bed. Mm -hmm. Do you know? So do you, do you know where I'm going with that? Yeah, 100%. So, so for a woman to... For a woman to um, Engage in those sorts of activities will absolutely help her, but she's probably going to need a lot of support to actually do it to get the results where she's going to feel the benefits. So let me throw this out there then, Tammy. What about doing a yoga class via Hangouts or Pilates via Hangouts? Something that where the mum doesn't need to leave the comfort of her own home. She's getting the connection with some other people and, and also um, potentially being supported by those other people at the same time. What are your thoughts on that, Tammy? That could work. That could work. See, for Tammy, a mum who is amazing, isn't it? It's just wonderful. An online yoga class. Mm -hmm. You could be onto something there, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's um. Interesting concept. What you can use is the power of what we're doing now with Hangouts. There's so many applications for it. Um, like 
just for example, and this is just brief, I just want to get touch on this. You can use Hangouts for a baby monitor within your own home. Um, so you can have a Hangout running while you've got your uh, mobile phone, for example. But my point being through this, this uh, what I'm saying is, and what I'm hearing from you, Tammy, is support is the biggest thing that's going to help with anything through this process. So if you can feel supported, and if that doesn't necessarily mean leaving your home, talking on the phone, um, reaching out and connecting with people, whether it's via Hangout, a phone, having people come around, and the right connecting with the right people, that the chances are you're going to help um, deal and cope with the uh, the situation at hand. Um, so, Tammy, what is the best thing that friends and family can do to help? So, you know, I, you know, I can I can speak from personal experience here, and it's going to be different for everyone. But what I found helped is people just being really kind. Do you know, when when you haven't had a shower for two days and your hair's sticking up every which way and you're still in your pyjamas at four o'clock in the afternoon and your house looks like a tip and the baby's got a dirty nappy, having someone come in and look around your house and go, wow, what have you been doing, is not helpful. Um, and getting a lecture about when I was a girl we wouldn't have been able to do this, do you know our house was always clean, that doesn't help either. I was so fortunate because I had a beautiful mother-in-law. I have. She's still alive. <laughs> and she came and she would say to me, you're doing a great job. You're looking after the baby. That's all you need to do. And she would she would just do stuff. She would do some vacuuming. She'd do some washing up. And I would be saying, I'm so sorry. The place looks like a tip. And she'd say, no, it looks like you've got a brand new baby, which was really nice and it really helped for me. That helped. Um. Being told that you're lazy because you've stayed in bed all day isn't helpful because a woman who stays in bed all day, something's going on because that's not normal behaviour. Do you know? A healthy person might stay in bed one day. They don't do it four days in a row because you don't, you don't want to do that when you're healthy. Something else is going on when someone's doing that. Um, there, if a woman normally keeps her house fairly tidy and all of a sudden it looks like, you know, an atomic bomb's gone off, then probably there's a message going on that something's going on. And you know, if she's looks like she hasn't had a shower for a couple of days and she normally has three showers a day, something's got something's changed and she's struggling. So having people say, what can we do to help? And having people say that it's okay to feel like this, you don't need to feel like this though, you can get help. You know, I can see that you feel this way means that that other people are observing that it's not just all in your head, do you know? Yeah. Which is a little bit different than saying, I know how you feel, because you don't know how I feel. You haven't walked in my shoes. Um, it's really, partner support is really important, because like I said earlier, a lot of women feel really anxious about disclosing how they feel, because they don't want their partner to think they're lazy, or their partner to think they're bad, because they don't love the baby. Or that they're, you know, that they've given up on their relationship, you know, just just saying to them, I really can see you're struggling, and you know, this is not like you, and you don't need to feel this way. We can get some help for this. It, you know, that that is an enormous sense of relief to have someone say to you that we can get help, and then and put it together as a group. So, so what I'm hearing in there, Tammy, and um Correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you approach this with a hard and fast, um, like you were kind of really confrontational about it and said, look, you've been lazy, you're doing all this, um, and this isn't getting done, da, da, that's going to make the situation wor worse. But if you approach it from a, a point of, of, I guess, caring and nurturing and loving um, and being really supportive, then the chances are that there's more of a chance that the, the woman will open up more to you and, and feel comfortable and feel supported and will want to work as a team to move through this and um, will potentially even recognise in herself that there, there might be something a little bit amiss here and that it's going to take more than herself to get out of this and, and basically work as a team with someone or a group of people to move forward. 
you know, if if you're approaching it with a hard and fast thing of, you know, you should be able to do this and you you're lazy, I would uh, I would suggest that you look at the statistics. And in Australia, in this lucky country, the number one killer in the first 12 months of mothers post birth is suicide. That's that's just appalling. That that makes me feel sick even saying that out loud. We have got women dying from postnatal depression. And it, this is real. This is a tragedy that is happening in front of our eyes and we need to help. And we need women to be able to speak up and say, I can't do this, I need help. And we need people around to be looking at this as the serious health issue that it is and stop blaming and stop judging and step up and help these women get the help they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Tammy. Um, it, it is tragic to hear that. Um, so, Tammy, I, I guess we're focusing a lot on the woman here. But what about the, the partner, the man, man in the relationship? Is it possible that PMD will affect the man as well? And um, I guess leading on from that, what happens if you get a situation where mum's got postnatal depression and dad's got postnatal depression as well? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Look, postnatal depression is a really significant event with men. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure of the statistics, but I think it's something like 10% of men get significant postnatal depression. Not the postnatal expression, but full-blown depression. Um, and it comes from a different place than the woman. Like the, the woman's got the whole hormonal, um, you know, sleep deprivation, breastfeeding adjustment thing to go on with. The father doesn't have that hormonal thing so much. But he's got his own big journey of responsibilities and sleep deprivation and feeling helpless as he watches his partner go through this journey and he can't really, you know, he may feel helpless to do anything because he doesn't know what to do. Um, men are particularly unsupported at this point because, you know, and, and I think this was mentioned in one of the, the New Parenting Hangout posts, the attitude towards men is, what are you complaining about? You didn't give birth, you're not breastfeeding, you know, suck it up. And, you know, it's a massive, massive life transition for men with all the responsibilities that come on their shoulders now, often with the financial responsibilities of now the, if they've been two cup, like a couple working, now it's a single income family. Um, and, and the household responsibilities usually will fall significantly onto his shoulders because mum's depressed or she's, you know, sleep deprived or she's feeding during the night, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of this stuff can be expected of, of dad that is out of the blue, that he hadn't really thought about. You know, he's expected to do the laundry now and he's expected to do the cleaning and he's expected to provide for the family. And when he walks in the door, here, you have the kid. I've had it all day and it's crying and I don't know what to do with it. And not only that, if especially if she's got depression and she's withdrawn from him and doesn't want to have sex, it's enough to do anybody's head in, let alone, you know, somebody who may already be inclined towards depression or have not have their own strategies for coping with, like, big life events like this. Um, so support networks for men are really good. We've got a lot of online support networks um, in Australia. We've got the Beyond Blue is an excellent, especially for men. Um, and, like, and there was a few that were listed on New Parenting Hangout too that we put up there for where men can go to for support. Um, yeah, so it's look, it's a massive, massive journey for everybody involved and they all need support. So yeah, what I continually keep on hearing from this, Tammy, that support is the biggest thing and I, I can speak from experience around um, the support side of things. I don't know how any of the depression side of things works or anything like that, um, but the support in general from everyone and having a supportive network of people around you and people that are, that are this is something else that I'd like to add, 
people that are at a similar stage in life to you as well that are going through similar experiences. So um, families that either have young children or that families that are pregnant um, that are around the same, I guess, journey in life actually is they're easier to connect to because you can talk about anything that pops up that's happening with you, like teething or, or what, whatever, whatever it is, you can talk about that with them. Whereas people that are, say, um, a little bit older and not so much older, but have older children, they might not connect with what's going on with you right at that very point in time. So I think the support thing is massive in, in the whole um, birthing and pregnancy and um, beyond period. Um, it's just that's just something that really resonates with me is, is the support and the more support you can get and it doesn't matter if that supports from your very close knit family or friends close friends or even if it extends out to getting support through professional services. Um, so Tammy, what, <coughs> what um, if any, and I'm not sure on this at all, but are there resources available for friends and family so they can? One, maybe do some research to help the situation, but two, it's going to affect them. If they know that their loved ones are feeling depressed and they can't do anything to help them, um, is there any support for them as well in the background? Um, you know, I would, I would, well, I send families of clients to Panda. Um, Panda is an anagram for something. <laughs> I think it's post and antenatal depression association. Well, that might that'll do anyway. But <laughs> P A N D A Panda, because they have a whole huge um, section of resources for family and friends of what what you can do to help. It's got um, resources for partners. It's got resources for partners with depression, partners with postnatal depression. Um, it, it's like an outstanding site. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's brilliant. And and from there, you can springboard to other resources and other support groups. Um, you know, look, if you've got a family member with postnatal depression, and you have no experience with depression, it can be really overwhelming because you just you can't actually make it go away. All you can do is listen and listen and listen and you can't give advice. Actually, advice is really counterproductive because advice is just going to probably make the woman feel like you don't understand even more because you're trying to fix it. Um, and yep, there it is. Um, you all you can do is listen and listen, and then listen some more, and be prepared that when she talks to you today, she's probably going to say the same thing tomorrow, and she's going to say go round and round in circles because that is the nature of depression and and that's okay but as, as someone who's not experienced with depression that can become frustrating especially if you're giving advice that you know would work look go out go to a you know a yoga class or go for a jog or do this or do that and she doesn't have the motivation to do it and then she has the same conversation with you tomorrow you're going to feel like well what's the point because you're not listening to what I'm saying but you are not. You are missing the point of what is going on with depression. So Panda has got some fantastic um, 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 worksheets and notes for families and friends to look through, which will give them an understanding and give them an expectation of behaviours, and it normalises those depressive behaviours. Nice screen share there, Tom. I've just pulled up the um, screen share here, Tammy, so you can uh, you can see the site. But uh, so it's post an antenatal depression association. Um, so the thing that uh, is showing up for me here as well is that it looks like it's a very well laid out site with lots of um, education. But the thing that caught my eye straight away was the site's available in seven languages. So which is really important if you're we, we live in a very multi, multicultural society and um, that's another thing that you could feel isolated because you, maybe you, English isn't your first language. Um, so having an association like this where you can reach out to and it's friends and families that can get 
information and, and services to help um, yourself and um, other people through an experience like this, I think it is really vital um, for the community to have access to. Um, and the website address was panda.org.au, so P-A-N-D-A.org, so dot, uh, yeah, dot .au. So, um, so Tammy, I guess moving on from there, um, and I guess that's, is there anything else that you want to talk about before we move on to the last thing I was, I was just going to bring up? No, look, it, it's a complex, it's a complex issue, Tom, um, and it's it's been going on for a long time, postnatal depression, but we are seeing more and more of it um, in our society, and you know, I think there the complexities as to why the rate of postnatal depression is growing, uh, like that's a subject for 12 months worth of hangouts on its own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are so many different reasons. And we can't touch on those tonight, but you know, the, I, th I think you've already said it a few times that the the role of support is cannot be understated, and the the importance of giving women permission to say how they feel, no matter what they're feeling, and it doesn't matter if that feeling is. You know, I had one mum tell me that when she was standing there with her, her little baby, her four-week-old baby in the pusher at the traffic lights, she said, I would just stand there thinking how easy it would be for me just to shove this stroller out into the traffic and it would all be over. And she said, I felt absolutely terrible that that's how I was feeling. And I said, but that's how you were feeling. That's how you were feeling. And, you know, it, it's it must feel, make you feel terrible that you're feeling that way, but you're expressing it, so now we can do something about it. But, you know, that's a horrible place to be trapped in, but we need to give women to permission to say this out loud and not make them feel like people are going to make a judgment about them, take their baby off them, you know, label them, that, that this means this is just a symptom to show that you need to get some help. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that lady has moved um, on to there and has a loving relationship with her baby and everything now that she's dealt with that issue. Um, she actually, she actually does. She sent me some photos not long ago to show me, like, and she's back on track. She went to a mother baby unit. She spent two weeks there. She got some fantastic strategies. Yeah, you know, she's and she's just absolutely thriving. And she can't believe she felt like that now, but mm -hmm. that's how she felt at the time. Yeah. So something I just heard in there, Tammy, as well, it sounds like that um, dealing with postnatal depression is a long-term solution slash strategy rather than just a short-term Band-Aid fix. Um, would that be right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it is. There's, there's multiple facets to it. And, you know, if a woman has postnatal depression with one baby, she may very she runs a pretty good chance of maybe having a similar experience the next time if she doesn't put some strategies in place mm -hmm. to get on top of it or to have the support there when it hits and have people on the alert so that she gets help a bit earlier next time. Okay. So this has been really informative again, Tammy. I want to thank you for joining us again today. But uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to talk about next week briefly because I think it ties into the whole theme that we've been talking about through our posts um, about postnatal expression and postnatal depression and leading into something that can help um, with this which is uh, placenta encapsulation. So is that something that you're quite passionate about Tammy? Yes! Placenta encapsulation! Yay! Perfect, perfect. No, so I think it's important to uh, bring the information to the, the community um, to have an opportunity to explore something that isn't quite 100% mainstream but can have some really beneficial results um, based on experience and based on some stuff that I, a lot of stuff that I've actually read about this. So um, I think that's going to tie in really well for this theme. So Tammy, do you want to come back next week and talk about that? I would be honoured, Tom. Perfect, perfect. So we'll wrap it up here tonight, Tammy. Um, I know that uh, we're running a little bit over time tonight. 
Um, so thanks again for joining us and thanks to everyone for watching and we uh, really appreciate your feedback in the posts on New Parenting Hangout. Um, you connect with us through any of the social media channels and uh, feel free to subscribe to our channel. We uh, have a weekly show that we, uh, our goal is to help um, educate so new parents can make informed decisions about pregnancy, birth and beyond. But thanks again for joining us and thanks Tammy and we'll catch you guys next week. Cheers.